Yeah, thank you to Robin Linus for his presentation. And now we'll move on to our final panel of the day, the uh, Covenant panel. Uh, it's moderated by our very own uh, Trey Del Bonis, and it includes members uh, Armin Sabori, Ethan Heelman, Keegan McClellan, and Stephen Roos. Please give him a round of applause. Uh, hey, everybody. So um, in case you couldn't tell, the people that are here are different than the people that are up on the screen. Uh, so Robin Linus, who you just saw, was supposed to be here, but uh, due to some flight issues, uh, he isn't. So instead, we got even more people that were booked. Um, so I'm going to let everybody here introduce ourselves. But uh, my name is Trey. I've been with the Expo for four years now, although this year I'm only doing this moderation. Um, but I've been in the, the Bitcoin space for about seven. Um, but why don't you take it off? Hi, I'm Ethan Heilman. Um, I'm a cryptographer um, and have been working uh, uh, in the Bitcoin space for a while. Had uh, some code contributions, worked on um, uh, the Bitcoin's peer-to-peer -peer network, did some privacy work with uh, Tumblebit. Um, and I'm currently uh, one of the BIP authors with Armin on Opcat. Hello. Uh, I'm Steven, uh, Steven Roos, been a Bitcoin developer for quite a while. Uh, used to work at Blockstream on the Liquid team, where we were building a sidechain. I'm currently trying to build Arc, and I'm also the author of the OptX hash uh, covenant proposal that um, Robin just talked about. Uh, my name is Keegan McClelland. Uh, I've worked in the space since, I guess, 2017, and I'm currently working as a protocol engineer on the Lightning Network. Cool. Hello. Hi, I'm Armin. I work on Bitcoin sidechains, research and development at Botanix. And uh, as Ethan mentioned, we have a proposal to re-enable OpCat into Bitcoin. Cool. So covenants have a bit of a long history. It was a bit of a long objection to, in the Bitcoin ecosystem um, going back very early on because they're not a complicated idea. Um, and without them, we have to go through a lot of contortions to be able to make more interesting kinds of smart contracts work, which you just watched uh, Robin go on about at great length. So why, don't, um, why doesn't someone introduce what exactly is a covenant? You can try that. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, so for those who know a little bit about Bitcoin and Bitcoin script um, or Bitcoin transactions, is that we use Bitcoin script to like express who is allowed to spend certain coins. And usually it's very simple. It's like you need to put a signature for this pub key. Uh, or you need to put two signatures out of these three puppies, like very simple uh, compositions that we can make. Um, but what those, um, what those scripts can do currently is only put restrictions on uh, the condition that needs to be valid to spend the transaction. And then once you, can, when you, once you fulfill that condition, you can do anything you want with the, with the transaction, with the money. Um, and what covenants are, are a way to limit not just who can, who can spend certain coins, but what they can actually do with those coins. So like you can say, if you spend the coins, you need to send them to this address. Or if you spend the coins, you need to always give a certain percentage here. Or if you spend these coins, they need to have a time lock. So they first need to go through a waiting period and then you can take the coins. So, so covenants are just a general idea of not just restricting who can spend certain coins, but what they can do with those coins when they're spent. Yeah, that basically covers it. Um, but what's, what's interesting is that there's no specific thing that is the covenant there's a bunch of different proposals for what a covenant could be and a bunch of different ways to achieve that. Um, so why don't you guys talk about your favorite kinds of covenants and how they work? So um, in, in general, uh, covenants uh, are, you can view them as a spectrum. Um, so you could, you could um, almost imagine, say, like a hash time lock contract being a covenant because you're saying that the spending transaction has to contain a pre-image. You're uh, uh, placing some rule on the spending transaction, what it pushes on the stack. Um, but that's not very covenant-like. That's like almost at uh, zero. Um, and then you can imagine covenants that are uh, extremely powerful and extremely general, where the spending transaction, the entire spending transaction, uh, can be inspected by the output that's being spent, and it can make all sorts of decisions about it. And you could even imagine something more powerful where you're like, you inspect the entire blockchain and you use that to determine whether um, whether you spend or not. Um, and uh, at least my view on Bitcoin is I like uh, very general purpose um, things uh, because if we're going to build uh, you know a very powerful layer two, that depends on the um, capabilities that are provided by layer one. Um, but there are trade-offs between 
how much power you put. Um, there are trade-offs uh, as the power you put at uh, layer one may have inherent um, like costs in terms of complexity or in terms of uh, providing new attacker capabilities. So my, my sort of non-answer to this is I want the most powerful covenants possible that uh, give us the least amount of risks. And power uh, was a bit of an objection to covenants going back in the early days because people thought like, okay, we're placing restrictions on how Bitcoins can be spent. Uh, that sounds scary, but really that ignores that you already can kind of do that um, with the scripting instructions that we have already. Um, and it gives you a lot of power. Um, but in order to sort of uh, attack that uh, sort of knee-jerk reaction, um, in case you can't tell, most of us are really in favor of covenants. Um, <laughs> in order to attack that reaction, uh, several years ago, former club member Jeremy Rubin proposed uh, check template verify. It was called different things at the time, but that was designed to be back. a very simple kind of covenant that just said, here's, you know, why don't I let you guys explain it? <laughs> Yeah, I can I can talk about CTV. Um, basically, so, so there, as uh, Ethan had mentioned, there's a spectrum on which covenants operate, and Jeremy, when designing CTV, chose to make something uh, that I'm going to use a couple of words and I'll backtrack and explain them. They are non-recursive and finitely enumerable covenants, and what that means is that. At the end of the day, when you are trying to describe the set of conditions that the transaction that spends your coins has to meet, you have to be able to fully enumerate all of the different paths that it's going to exit this covenant from. There's no way to just generalize and say, like, oh, it's anything that behaves like this. It's like it's either this transaction or this transaction or this transaction. You can have as long of a list as you possibly want of the or conditions, but it has to be like one of those. And you can do this at arbitrary depths as well. So you can, you know, I think you saw in Robin's last talk that, you know, you could break it up into an, a number of steps. And so you can have a covenant that spends only to a covenant that spends to only a covenant. And so you can imagine that if you wanted to design very complex protocols, you could then decide all of the different traversals through this graph that you want to be possible and then build that graph into a giant like CTV type covenant. What were the oppositions towards CTV, and are any of them true? Not 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 covenants in general, but CTV. That's a great question. Um, it's been a few years since the CTV controversy has like gone around, and like I think people's collective understanding has changed over over time. Um, my personal objections to CTV at this point are that it's just not powerful enough, right? Uh, Jeremy had intentionally designed it to be, like a more restricted power setting, so to speak, because people have this collective um, spook about you know, wanting to enable fully general covenants. And so you know, he was like, all right, well, we're not gonna be able to get what we want through, so how about we like, neuter this just a little bit, and then like, maybe it'll get more support. And you know, at this point, I think people are a little bit more um, aware of the actual trade-offs and, and more, I think, warm towards covenants than they were a few years ago. And so we may not end up doing something like CTV. We might just go for the jugular and get something that we actually want. And I want to stop there for a second because I meant to bring this up at the beginning of the presentation, but now we're starting to get into slightly more gutsy topics. If anybody, We want to structure this um, a little bit more of an open panel than some of the other panels today because it's getting into technical details. So if anyone has a question, uh, feel free to shout it out, ideally come up to the mic so we can all hear you, um, and, and ask us when there's a, a, an opportune moment about whatever these technical details are. Um, so is there any questions about CTV so far? What changes to the Bitcoin scripting languages are involved in making these covenants? And I mean, somebody mentioned Opcat. That's a great question. Yeah, I, I can answer the, at least the question about OpCat. Um, it's a pretty well isolated piece of code. Uh, it replaces what are called op success opcodes. These, these are upgradability mechanisms that were set by the last software, Taproot. Um, so it, it really doesn't change too much. It, it's actually a pretty well isolated piece of code in the interpreter. We just say we're replacing this opcode, and uh, here's a new definition for it. And uh, I think other covenant proposals that are just singular opcodes or maybe uh, pairs of opcodes would, would function similarly. Yeah, I think More generally, like... 
covenants don't require it. I mean, you don't need Opcat to do covenants, right? That's some other change. Am I so, understanding that correctly? <laughs> so covenants are a class of proposals. So any one of these will suffice. And we're like a lot of the engineering community is currently like debating each other about the merits and drawbacks of each individual approach, but that any one of them will work, and you don't need all of them. Um, you know, it, having all of them wouldn't hurt, but any one of them will suffice. And each one of them is implemented as either a single op code or a pair of op codes. And in order to get those opcodes to perform on the network, there would have to be a soft fork in each of these cases, which is what is causing a lot of the, you know, reticence to immediately jump and go and implement it, right? Maybe I can um, also just add to your, uh, you also had some question about CAT. So CAT isn't necessarily a precursor to covenants. It, it itself actually isn't a covenant opcode. It just happens to enable a weak and ugly form of covenant that gives us like roughly 80, 90% of what we would want out of covenants. It's not very pretty. And I hope that one day we, you know, if we start building covenants with CAT and actually you know, is the first uh, software that, that we replace it with an actual covenant opcode. So maybe that those transaction templating like CTV. Yeah. And there's another two questions here. <laughs> uh, microphone first, and then you can go. Not a question, but I'd just like to point out that one of the advantages also of CTV is that it makes an effort to avoid quadratic hashing by ensuring that uh, there is a fix, not, no matter, that even if you execute the same CTV on multiple inputs or multiple times in a single script, it just makes a single hash of all the output set. So that's one of the advantages also of CTV compared, for example, to something like TX hash, which in theory, every input can, you know, put some number of different hashes, which can give us quadratic hashing. If I can respond to that as the author of TX hash, uh, if, <laughs> if you would have read the bit, uh, I go through great lengths to avoid the possibility of quadratic hashing. Um, yeah, you should definitely read it. There's very different well, it is obviously an important factor to take into account. But what he's talking about for the people that uh, don't understand is that if we repurpose a certain opcode and give it certain new powers, uh, we need to be careful that someone cannot just use this opcode to like exploit the system and like with a certain transaction use a lot of resources of all the people that need to validate this uh, transaction and execute it. So like imagine there's a system we build some we add some new opcode and someone can spend a very like cheap transaction that doesn't cost a lot of bytes, so it doesn't cost a lot of fee, but somehow through the, the way they build the opcodes and the script can use a lot of uh, resources from the computer of the miners and of all the people who are validating, who have validating nodes. So that's something that we need to uh, take care of when we're designing these opcodes. Specifically, TX hash goes to create lengths to like introduce the possibility of a caching strategy where you wouldn't get quadratic hashing possibilities. Um, uh, well, you should just read it. Uh, <laughs> Because so, it, like, I, I went back and forth with many people who had concerns uh, on this. That, that ties in as a bit of an aside with something that's kind of unique about Bitcoin is that the script interpreter for Bitcoin doesn't have gas. Ethereum has gas because it's very stateful. There's lots of complicated things you can do with it. But in Bitcoin, uh, it's just you start here and the code goes to the right or down, depending on how you want to think about it. Um, and you don't have access to the kinds of state and complicated statefulness that Ethereum has, which is why Bitcoin is pretty powerful and we don't even meter our instructions. We just care about how big they are. That's the only thing you pay for in Bitcoin is how big they are. And so um, we could improve upon BitVM design, which has a pretty heavy chain cost, the new one, um, which is why we feel like we probably should have uh, the more express, I mean, me personally think, we should have more expressive uh, covenants so that we can avoid some of those um, demands. Um, but we mentioned, uh, oh, you had a question too, I'm sorry. Yeah, mine be better said, but I'll ask it again. Yeah. Um, so uh, I still, I guess, don't have a great understanding of um, what the implications of covenants would be from a practical standpoint, like what we could build that we can't build now. Um, I mean, I, I guess I understand, you know, things get more expressive, but like, uh, could you give examples of kind of where the limits are? And then it's a two-parter. The, the second one is like, what are the, um, what are, I guess, are the best arguments against covenants? Um, I guess before we get into kind of like the nitty-gritty differences between the individual types we could implement. 
So the, the main thing that is non-obvious, so like the, the obvious thing about covenants is it prevents you from spending to certain, like with certain types of transactions. You can limit the set of transactions that can spend your coins beyond just like what witness data people provide and say, these have to be spent in this way. One of the non-obvious consequences of that is that you actually get the ability now to have your contracts carry state. And the reason for this is there's there's a like neat trick from like category theory called the unite dilemma, which is an equivalence between an object and all of the possible like functions that you can compute over that object. So if you know all of the possible exit paths of a piece of state, you don't actually need to know what the state is. And the covenants limit, or like they, they allow you to fully describe all of the traversals through this graph, and therefore the state becomes implicit in the output. And it, this is at least the way that it would be accomplished in things like TX hash or in uh, CTV. Not all covenants are necessarily that way, but they all have this property where it's like, if you can restrict it, you can now say, like, it's not that this thing can go anywhere. As soon as we say it can only go some places, we now reveal information about what's inside that thing. I wanted to uh, jump in um, to provide a really, really simple use of covenants, um, which is uh, vaults, which in the original paper that introduced covenants, there may have been some work before, um, but the original uh, academic paper that introduced covenants, the primary use case was vaults. And the idea with a vault is that you have an output that um, uh, can be spent uh, to a, a transaction but that transaction is encumbered such that you can sort of like veto that and like uh, uh, spend it back to something that's controlled by the same pub key. So the idea is that this is to prevent um, uh, uh, like attacks where your key gets stolen. Someone steals your key and they spend to this output here and you're like, that's not me, I'm gonna use my veto key to return it back to my control. And then both parties are now essentially like eating away at that output with fees but the attacker never gets the, the output, right? So now you can negotiate with the attacker. You can be like, hey, you know, uh, I, you know I'll give you 5% um, uh, if you give me everything back, or we can just sit here and waste all this money and you won't get it. Um, and that, has, that, that conceivably could have a very big deterrence effect if you're like, hey, my outputs are controlled with this, so even if you do steal my key, we're just gonna uh, uh, waste the money. You're not gonna get it. Um, and I, it seems like, it is a very simple thing, but I think it's something that would be very valuable to uh, Bitcoin and um, uh, uh, security and help people self-custody. And I just want to add on to that too. Like there's good reasons to be able to limit the velocity of money more than just for the security. Like there's a lot of regulatory compliance reasons that you might want to be able to say, like we know that if even if we do lose money, we're not going to lose it faster than this fast. So that you can say like, that's, that's a thing in the traditional financial system is that like payments take a while to go through, T plus two, whatever. Um, it's nice in crypto that we can just do boom, done, it's over after 10 minutes. Uh, but you know, sometimes you don't want that because you wanna make sure, you wanna be able to give yourself certain guarantees about how your funds are gonna behave in the future. And I saw one more question up there. Nerdy, feel free to ignore. So um, a question about Rob said before, I think he said that the Bitcoin script language is recursive and not iterative. That's why it's not Turing complete. So that's wrong in two dimensions. Um, but the more important question is, to you guys, is Turing complete a bug or a feature? You know, the halting problem. That's a, this from said, Ethereum two years ago. I got an ovation five years ago when I said that about Ethereum. <laughs> so um, can you do this with finite state machines, um, which are not Turing complete? Um, can you, if you're gonna use a uh, stack language, can you somehow um, transcode into the JVM and therefore get all its proving mechanisms that uh, Oracle Sun did. That might be a value, I don't know. I did the JVM on your printer, so I... I, I think things. most people, well, most people I've worked with generally think in Bitcoin that uh, Turing completeness is a bug. Um, we, like, ideally, we would want to be able to express any finitely executing computation. We want expressive power, but you know, for the halting problem reasons, you don't want a computation that can go indefinitely. And like Ethereum solved this with the gas thing, but it's kind of clunky because it you can't know a priori looking at a transaction, halting problem, uh, that it's like going to uh, execute or, or like terminate or not. And so we'd like to be able to have those sorts of assurances in Bitcoin before you ever submit the transaction. 
Um, and so, you know, we, we, we would like them to be finite, but we would still like them also to be expressive beyond that. Um, yeah, I think. I think um, Robin did a great job explaining the thing with the whole BitVM concept where verification is cheaper than execution. And I think Bitcoin scripts generally also follow that, that model, not just BitVM, where like if you have a certain like big complex condition execution you want to have, you, you can always set it up in such a way that all the execution and the actual like determinism whether the condition is valid or not can happen off chain. And the only thing you need to put in the system is a kind of a proof that it happened like in a certain state. And then, and then the, the blockchain can like um, validate that, that proof. But like you don't need to have all the different paths in the if, like if you write code, like you have if and else, whatever, you can just put only the path that actually got executed and then say, this is, this is the one that, that we want and then put it on the chain. Yeah. And, and verification has to be decidable because that's what it means to verify something. Um, and, and to tie in with a little bit more theory, if you've taken an entry level uh, through your computation class, you know that an NP program can be verified in P time. Um, as a really easy example of that, Bitcoin mining is if you squint an NP problem, you have to grind a hash until you get the right hash. Uh, but verifying that hash is really easy. You just hash it. Um, and so that's kind of like a very crude example of what we mean about the verification is cheaper than execution. It's, it's not just a rule of thumb. There's actually proofs about it. <laughs> um, so um, we mentioned what? I can come back to another question that was asked about like use cases and why we want oh, yes. yeah, um, yeah, to Because yeah, we mentioned vault. Vaults are like an obvious example of where you need some kind of state to be preserved because you say, I want to spend money to Alice, but I need to be, it, you need to delay it. So you need to like first go into some other state and then you need to remember that actually you wanted to send this money to Alice, right? So it's like an obvious use case where you need to like have some state in between your multiple transactions. Um, like obviously it doesn't, it doesn't stop there. Like we just saw Robin is like building an insane system to like do all kinds of bridging. And obviously like he needs some state and he's doing really, really, really ugly things to like get a little bit of state in a Bitcoin transaction. So obviously if we like, like just an opcode that gives you some kind of state, um, everything that BitVM aims to build, which is mostly currently, um, trusted bridging, uh, between side chains, we would get that out of the box with a, with a, or way easier, um, with a, a covenant. And apart from that, there's other kinds of um, protocols that even we, we currently only have been having CTV, like CTV is the oldest formal covenant proposal that's been out there. It's been out there for a real long time. I think almost four or five years. I think 2019 when it was called yeah. secure the bag. Yeah, yeah <laughs> like, like a really long time. And only recently people have been like thinking that this might actually happen. I've been brainstorming about what kind of protocols we can build. And Arc is one of those examples where with CTV, they came up with an idea where we can have an entire off-chain protocol that seems to be pretty powerful just by using CTV. So all these other proposals like direct introspection, TX hash, they have only been around, like the ideas have been floating around only for like one or two years. So like, I think, I really believe if people start brainstorming what you can do with all these things, like we're gonna see a lot of innovation in like layer, extra layer two protocols that we can build with this government. Yeah, actually I have an example of that from, from my work is that I have, on more than one occasion, I think only twice now, but observed that went like in the lightning design, if we had a covenant thing, we could uh, reduce interactivity between you and your counterparty uh, because we would not necessarily need as many like pre, right now you can do covenants with pre-signed transactions, but that requires you to exchange messages back and forth. And some of that interactivity can be eliminated, which makes things more stable and makes things uh, less prone to error. Um, and, and so it can actually make some of these layer two protocols just more efficient or reliable, just having these techniques available to you. Yeah, I mean, even going back to self-custody, um, there, there's tons of wins there. I mean, you, you mentioned vaults, but even a simpler use case could just be if you, if you have access to what inputs are being spent, uh, you know, if, if it goes over uh, X value, I'm going to require a multi-sig to be present. If it maybe is just Y, uh, I can spend from a single sig. You can already start thinking about how you can build better self-custody tools. And one more question, then I want to bring in some new ideas. <laughs> um, yeah, Robin and uh, Bitvm has been coming up a lot. I imagine you guys were following kind of the wizard stuff, um, the, the Medium article. Um, I was wondering, basically, if you, like, had any, like, 
decisive thoughts on that, if things are just kind of undecided, if covenant or yeah, covenants replaces some of that um, architecture or sorry, there's a couple of questions there. But. The architecture of what exactly? Um, yeah, so if we're looking at like um, how BitVM and Covenants both work, um, does Covenants like uh, the software for Covenants replace some of um, the need for something like a, a design like BitVM? Yes, <laughs> straight up. Bit BitVM is a unbelievably clever trick to not need Covenants to do it. It's not, I, at least in my, I'm not like a deep expert in this and like other people may disagree with me. But in my estimation, if you had Covenants, I don't even think Robin would try to go for BitVM at the way that it's designed. It's just that betting your the future of your work on a consensus change has not historically been a profitable enterprise. And so, you know, people are rightly not necessarily betting on, on it. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't, as a community, try to come up with mechanisms to, like, get these things done. And it's not just governance. Like, um, like you saw, Robin said... Bitcoin script doesn't even have multiplication. So he's he's like even implementing just simple integer multiplication using like other tricks. So like uh, simple things like cat, like for those who have heard the name of cat but don't know what it is, all that opcat does is just takes a bunch of bytes and another bunch of bytes and put them together in a larger bunch of bytes. And if we just have that, BitVM already would become so much easier. Other, other like um, ideas like mat could become like almost like implementable. Um, it's even proven that you can build an entire covenant with just concatenating two bunches of bytes. They're going to be really ugly, but you can do it. So like, it's, it's, it's not just covenants that like would, would bring us further. It's like very simple things like concatenating bytes, multiplication, working with 64-bit numbers, all these kinds of things um, that would make script like so much more powerful. It'd be really nice if we didn't have to do BitVM. Like, yeah, exactly. there's a bunch of stuff that becomes incredibly easier if we have even basic uh, covenants, but BitVM shows because, I don't know if he mentioned it at the end of the presentation because we were getting mic'd up, but BitVM shows one of Robin's other projects is called ZeroSync, which is a, a Stark for all of Bitcoin. You could just go verify that like some other transactions happened within this Stark system and boom, you have a covenant for whatever you could possibly want. It, we don't want to do that because it's really ugly and gross and every time you want to verify a covenant, you have to put however many kilobytes of data on chain. So that's expensive. We could do it cheaper and better if we had Covenant. And you were about to say something, too. Oh, cool. All right. Um, so we mentioned um, soft forks. And we haven't had a soft fork in a couple of years now. The last one was Taproot. And Taproot unlocked a whole bunch of really interesting stuff. Um, but before Taproot, it had been five years? Five years since Segwit. 2017. Yeah. yeah. OK, so four years. Um, which is a bit of a long time, considering that Ethereum does a hard fork every like eight months or something, and other chains do it like every couple of weeks. Um, so, like, there's, it's kind of hard to say uh, why that is, but I'm sure you guys have some opinions on why it's been a while since we've had a, a soft fork before Taproot. I mean, politics, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, so just like my my personal opinion is that. Um, uh, getting something into Bitcoin, it's not like, there's not like one person you have to convince and be like, oh, this person's got buy-in or we've got some small set of, you know, uh, companies, you know, uh, Coinbase and, you know, Binance, we get them both on board and we can push anything through. Like, uh, you know, uh, Bitcoiners are sort of contrarians. They don't, uh, they're not super excited about authority. So the notion that some, you know, like company or some small set of people can push changes through is kind of antithetical to Bitcoin. So to get a soft fork, you really have to get in like, like buy-in with a, a large segment of the community. Um, and that's actually, a, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a strength of Bitcoin, um, but it also makes uh, getting these things in um, uh, pretty difficult. Um, and I, I think there's like trade-offs there, but I think Bitcoin more than some of the other coins where there's, you know, like the person in charge who says this is going to happen. Um, that's something I actually like really admire and like about Bitcoin. Um, so I'd love to see, you know, some of these ideas get soft forked. But at the end of the day, if the Bitcoin community doesn't want it, they don't want it. And that's just, you know, that's sort of what Bitcoin is. It's actually worse than that, though, because it's not just about having to get a whole bunch of the community support, uh, like, behind it. It's that no one knows who constitutes the community. 
and no one knows what the process is to go and actually get that support. To this day, I actually do not know what the sequence of events for Taproot to get activated was. It just, everybody seemed to support it out the gate, and so it like had a relatively smooth process until activation, because that's the other thing, is that Taproot was, at, like, even though everybody kind of universally agreed that we wanted Taproot, nobody could really agree how we wanted to turn it on. And so it's like, there's just this very arduous, undefined, messy process that gets, that, that has not been repeatable. And so like, it's a lot of will. And like most of the people who would be doing this aren't really, they're not getting paid. A lot of it is open source, like volunteer work. They might have like, they might be getting paid by some other mechanism, but. So th there is no process, and I'll go as far as to say like, there will never be a process. I think every time we, we do this, it has to be new. It has to be chaotic, it has to be dramatic, and it, it, it's just never gonna be defined. And I think that's one, of the, that's one of the things that defines Bitcoin consensus as Bitcoin consensus is that it's really, really hard to change it. And you kind of see that as a, the code level and then also social consensus. I'm not sure I agree with that. I think yeah. it can be really hard to change and still be more or less streamlined or like, at have least some kind clear. of precedent. Yeah. Like at if, least like if, I know the sequence of things. Yeah. <laughs> and you can build on precedent and still make it really hard to, to change, right? Um, from my like my own kind of like remembrance, I, I think what happened a little bit was that Segwit solved a really imminent problem that not only was needed to build lightning, people were getting very excited about lightning and it didn't work, and then we needed something that was fixing an actual bug kind of in Bitcoin called transaction malleability. And I think from the developer community, like the technical community, everyone was kind of on board with SegWit immediately because it's a fairly obvious way to take like the input data out of the, out of the transaction. So te technically it was like a no brainer, but then what, what happened for like miraculous reasons, somehow it was like stepping on the foot of some miners who were getting some advantage by this not existing. And then also like the hard fork got the hard fork like I, I did to like get bigger blocks got into this and then it became like an entire mess. Those of you who have been around maybe still have PTSD from this entire mess. Many of us have PTSD from this entire mess. And then what happened was like, oh, people were like, oh no, we're not doing soft works anymore because we could get this entire mess again. It was like, it took several years. Um, it was a really hard fight. And then with, I, I, I think maybe what, what kind of happened is that because of this, no one was really thinking about soft forks at all. And then suddenly there was Taproot. And everyone was like, whoa, that's kind of cool because we all wanted Schnorr signatures, which was another thing people have been like wanting for a while. We all wanted like something like Mast, which kind of like improves this like verification over execution strategy a little bit. And it was just like so cleanly blended together. There was a bit of back and forth with like some other alternative proposals, but then suddenly like Taproot was there and everybody loved it. And I think it just kind of magically happened. There was a bit of like, how do we activate it and all that? But like, we were very aligned very fast. Um, and now like, let me finish. Um, covenants are just so d different. Like there's so many wildly different ways we can go about it. And many people like many different ideas um, that it's like, there's not just one thing on the table that everybody goes like, wow, this is neat. We want this. Covenants is like, oh, but this is, this is better than this in this regard. And that is better than that in this regard. And it's like, ooh. So I think it's just a process of finding, finding the ones that, that we want. And there's a question up there. Can you come to the mic? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we, we've obviously had like kind of two camps emerge over the last couple of years. Uh, one is sort of an ossification camp, um, and one is a kind of more expressive camp, which I think most of you guys belong to. Uh, the first question would be in the ossification camp, uh, is the belief there in, in your view that, you know, we no longer want to scale Bitcoin to a billion users at this point. We really just are looking for like store value number go up for a relatively kind of small number of people who will actually be able to use block space. Um, and then the second one, uh, and we can probably answer these in bunches, uh, but there's been sort of some talk around the next soft fork not actually going through Bitcoin Core. Uh, do you guys think that's viable and realistic or is that just kind of like uh, hearsay? What was the second question? Uh, like, is there a chance that the next soft fork doesn't go through Bitcoin Core? That's a spicy question. <laughs> yeah, we already forgot the first one. And in, in regards to your first question, um, I really wish there was a pro ossification person here, because um, I think uh, I like I don't want to um, misrepresent their views. Um, so uh, you know, I have my own internal head idea of their their views, but I'm clearly not convinced by it. So like, I don't think I could do 
a convincing argument the way someone who is pro-ossification um, could. Uh, the second question, I don't know. Uh, I think it's, it's <laughs> I think something like 90% of nodes are Bitcoin core, probably more, probably more like 95 or 96. So it's really hard to have different Bitcoin implementations because you just have to replicate all these like bugs that have existed for years. Well, so. you can fork. Well, yeah, it's forking. Ah, I see. It. So this actually did happen. So addressing the the alternate implementation, there was both the UASF client for Segwit in 2017. That was like technically not Bitcoin Core. It was heavily based on Bitcoin Core. It was like Bitcoin Core plus like a small patch, and a bunch of people went and ran that. The, the, there was also an attempt to do this again in the Taproot soft fork. It did not get the support that it would have needed in order to succeed, but it also didn't need it because we were able to come to an agreement on trying to do a minor activated soft fork instead, even though some people don't like that. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's a, a very large resistance by core maintainers to want to merge consensus code. And I think there are a lot of good reasons for that. Like I don't really blame them. Um, but as a result, like I do actually think that most of the soft forks are going to come through alternative clients. But the, I put alternative in quotes because it's like 99 plus percent Bitcoin core code. Yeah, like for example, the with CTV, like the changes that you'd have to make to enable CTV, like isn't the diff like two dozen lines of code? It's really well, small. <laughs> yeah, the consensus diff, yes. Yeah. And you have some standardness and stuff like that. Oh, that's true. But the core like script change yeah, is yeah. really not significant, um, which is like, again, it was supposed to be a strength of it, but there is a reasonable argument that it is too restrictive. Um, but I think the ossification point is is kind of strange because Bitcoin is pretty committed to doing soft forks. If you don't like a soft fork, you don't have to adopt it. Everybody else will if if it's popular. But um, because of the way UTXOs work, like you don't have to adopt it. Your client doesn't have to use it, um, but you're still using the same Bitcoin chain that everybody else is, uh, which is another difference with Ethereum because if they want to change the price of a certain instruction, it might have downstream effects that impact you um, in how expensive it is to do certain things. And you can't do anything about that because it's a hard fork. Um, whereas Bitcoin's asset model naturally leads to that sort of more individualized uh, use cases. Um, so that also ties in with your question about the uh, ob objections to covenants. Um, I think there's some sort of philosophical objections about what is Bitcoin. I think it originates from some old G Maxwell post from 2013. I think it was mostly a joke post. It was like, just come up with all the, you know, malicious things you could do with covenants. And then someone mentioned, oh, you know, you could have government control. Um, you know, if you have a, something like a recursive covenant, a government can kind of taint those coins and control what you can do with it. But l largely those things were jokes. Um, and I think some, some mainstream Twitter kind of took on it and real FUD was created. Uh, I certainly heard that. Uh, when I heard about covenants, but uh, when you think about it, you could actually, uh, you know, if the government wanted to taint your coins, you can, they can certainly do it with a uh, two of two multi-sig as well. Yeah, and uh, I forget which 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 uh, MIT Bitcoin Expo it was, but I um, uh, I had a challenge for people to come up with. Um, I think I offered to buy someone a, a cup of coffee if they could, um, like, for the most uh, the worst dark covenant someone could come up with. And so far, no one's really taken me up on that offer. And I believe um, uh, Andrew has uh, added like a can of beer to that offer as well. Um, so I think, but that was like three or four years ago. Um, and every once in a while, it'll blow up on Twitter. But like the, the, in many cases, it seems like the fear of covenants is, 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 is high, but the actual, like when you think through it, it's, it doesn't seem that bad or I shouldn't say it's hard to prove and impossible. So I am open to people coming up with very bad dark covenant um, things where like covenants are terrible, but uh, I've not been presented with it. And I, uh, uh, I've i spent some time thinking about it and I've kind of reached the conclusion that covenants aren't, aren't bad. Um, but if anyone has any like really good dark covenant ideas, I'd love to hear them. Um, the, the, and just... Yeah, I'll take that. I feel like it's less about covenants, like allowing people to steal your Bitcoin or something, and more about just general flexibility, introducing things like inscriptions and runes, and like, there are people that definitely feel those types of things are not what they want Bitcoin to be part of, and all these like L2 ideas 
will be more, will get more economic energy if the bridge, bridge is like more practical and more trustless and like more performant, then like all those things that they don't like uh, will be more easier to do. And I think that's probably like what makes people not like covenants rather than like covenants will introduce a bug that allows you to steal Bitcoin. I think that's true now. I don't think that that was the texture of the conversation two years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's definitely now. Definitely, definitely not. Well, just to, if I could feed in a question, um, I think there was a few views around like CT, uh, um, uh, uh, like like some some of the opcodes might not be expressive enough, and we should go for the so something that is like actually what we want rather than like the first step. Uh, and I think our conversations around the soft fork being very difficult to do increasingly is kind of a good evidence point towards like yeah maybe this is the last one that we get and we should make it count. Uh, so then what which covenant proposal or, or, or combinations of them uh, do, do you guys think is like enough if the, you only get one e enough or what we want <laughs> what, 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 do you, what do you want what do you want yeah what do you no, want is a better better way to put it, I think I think it touches on an interesting point because there's kind of like two different not camps but like categories maybe you could make it's like there's some covenant proposals that are very application specific and notably the one called up vault it literally says vault so like they want to build a vault right <laughs> And as engineers, I think we're all engineers here, um, is like, you don't want like have an opcode for an application because then like someone wants to build another application and they need their own opcode, right? So what, what we generally tend to like is opcodes that are like constructions, like building blocks. So like you can do cats, you can do application, you can do like a certain bunch of things and then you can build your own applications using the, those building blocks. But then, I mean, and there are some covenant proposals that are more generalized like that. But then I did the mental exercise um, how would you do a vault and what kind of like primitives would you need to do something like a vault? Because I wasn't initially very like against a vault. I'm still not a fan, but like the, the whole script environment is quite complicated. And actually, if you want to implement a vault using like simple things, like maybe what could you do like PX hash or cat or something like that, you need actually a whole bunch of like new stuff, right? And I think what, what no one wants to do at this point is like do a soft fork proposal that lists like 17 opcodes <laughs> and say like, if we have all those, we can do everything. <laughs> While like there's this other proposal that adds one opcode and like at least we know we get faults and it's only one opcode. Yeah, and I mean, it's also not hard to argue why why that's the case. Like how does anybody in this room feel about omnibus legislation getting passed? Like like a thousand things going through in the same bill. It's like, it's not really the best thing. So generally speaking, we do want soft forks to be single purpose. Now that doesn't mean it has to be one op code, but it has to be like one like coherent idea that like people can reject or accept in full. Yeah. Um, oh. I'll restate it. Yeah, go ahead. Describe like in layman's terms the difference between the two statements. It's a potentially stupid question, but like first statement is Bitcoin doesn't support covenants, and the second statement is Bitcoin doesn't support the bridge mark one. So okay. where's the red line? So I'm, I'm actually confused. The question was about um, the difference between two statements that he made, and the first statement was Bitcoin doesn't support covenants versus Bitcoin doesn't support Turing complete smart contracts. And that's a really good question. Actually. Well, I think I think they're like, I feel your your confusion, but they're actually totally different things. So, like Turing completeness is about execution. It's about you have a certain program, and Turing complete Turing completeness is like, or you have a certain program environment, and Turing completeness is about what can that program environment do, what kind of expressiveness in your programs can you do, and covenants is is not about it's not about execution. It's about introspection. It's about this environment happens in the context of a certain transaction and covenants is, is about what can the execution environment know about this transaction like this transaction might have three outputs but the script you're executing cannot know what how many outputs the, the the transaction had right so it doesn't matter if you're like like turing completeness is about execution and covenant is about introspection it's about knowing what's going on like this execution is part of someone spending some transaction and we want to like look at this transaction and see like, oh, is it about, is it, is it, is it, is it like, like what kind of outputs are there? What kind of inputs are there? Like, I want to make sure that this outputs only can have values that are below five Bitcoin, right? So like stuff like that. It's like looking at the context and during completeness is about like how powerful the execution is. Is there an ultimate, like ultimate point where we're 
breach covenant, or there's no <laughs> such so that, like just like. Well, the point is, we to add one. So, so like, yeah. Go ahead. Go. Yeah, I was just gonna say, like, if we enable one of these, then you can do covenants. And in in some sense, when you say that Bitcoin doesn't support covenants, it's that's almost true. And it, the reason is that you can emulate covenants with pre-signed transactions. It's just that it's grotesquely inefficient to do so. Very similarly to what you saw in like some of the the presentation that Robin gave in the previous hour, is that like we can do all these things, but it's like a complexity class reduction if we get like one op code. In, in the script VM. Cheaper and better is the way you should think about it. And vice versa. So if, we ha if it is Turing complete, I don't know what it is, then you can do covenants or anything if you can do it. Well, uh, I think there's a really interesting distinction there because there's like Turing complete and then there's what your Turing machine can see. So you could have a Turing complete output, but it can't see um, data that is inside the transaction that's spending it. Because that's not actually that's like additional data that it that it can't see. Like it can compute anything, but it can't know everything. You know, your 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 machine that's not connected to the internet can't tell what the stock price is. So, well, so it could be that you have a machine that has no data attached. That has nothing to do with Turing complete. So exactly. So the sort of covenant and the ability of covenants to inspect something outside of the program, you can view as an oracle, and it. It doesn't necessarily uh, impact Turing completeness. Uh, it does. Inc it does allow you to sort of chain transactions together, but they're actually like very different things. Like one of them is computability and execution, and one of them is like, you know, can this program see this other program all the way at the other side of the room? So just to add on that a little bit, you could also think about it not just as an oracle, but like what's on the tape when the program starts. If you want to think about it formally, two questions. Microphone first. <laughs> So there's actually a lot of stuff that I can add to this. And one of the things that I want to point out is, has anyone heard what quining is? Quiling? Quining. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. A, a program okay. that can output its own program. <laughs> In the context of, uh, of covenants, you can have a program that is able, you can have a script that is able to be given itself and then can use that input to impose on the output that it is also executed on the output, which now gets you very close to something much like Turing completeness. So you might because be able you're now able to yes. That's the proof of concept, yes. Well, you might be able to give it the program of itself, but at the moment you can't actually attest yeah, at the to whether that, that is the program that's being executed. And that, that's the thing is that covenants are actually a couple of different. No, things. no, no. What? Not the program that's being executed, but rather the program that will be executed on the next iteration, on the output. And then you can then impose that that program will check that it is given itself as the quine by, for example, hashing your program, then putting that as part of your output. So, so it, it seems so like... So it's going to verify that it was given the correct program and that it was given itself. Sounds so, like you read my roll-up proposal. Put it. So, yeah, so no, seriously, because uh, Dave Harding asked that on the mailing list, asked your question on the mailing list, and I gave an example that it can be used to implement drive chains, and we did not activate drive chains when it was proposed. So if we did not activate drive chains, why would we support you know this kind of uh, self-recursive covenants? Wow, but that's, but, but anyway, that's, but that's, you know but that's what? A stupid in the end, it's like... it doesn't actually matter because what matters to us is whether you can verify it in a single step. So in this case, you can verify it in a single transaction, and if you need to keep adding more transactions to it, then what happens is that fees are involved to get those additional transactions, which is now equivalent to gas in Ethereum. That's exactly right, actually. No, the, the, every state transition that you want is going to be carried through UTXO churn. But that's fine because each individual step, yeah, it's just that you know you're only paying the fees for the next step and you're committing to the state change that happens in the next step. And, and to come back to your other point um, that we didn't want drive chains so we shouldn't ever uh, enable something that can enable drive chains, I think it's kind of a silly argument. I mean, like you can, in most countries at least, you can buy guns, but it doesn't mean you can buy metal, right? I mean, 
yeah, someone can still like build the things that we didn't want, like as a first class citizen, but that doesn't mean that, um, that, that like you shouldn't be able to build anything else. Yeah, but there are engineers that you get for a simple carbon. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay. Good argument. <laughs> and there's another question, but then uh, we have less than 10 minutes left, so I want to sort of bring it a little back up to, to flight speed or down to earth. I don't know. So uh, go ahead. Hi, I, I'm Fari from Mutual Knowledge Systems. Uh, there are other uh, UTXO blockchains that have covenants. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Bitcoin Cash, uh, Cardano, and um, Nervos, who have very interesting designs. Uh, Bitcoin Cash has all the missing opcodes. That, uh, that was actually one of the reasons of the fork. But the, the one thing with Bitcoin Cash covenants is that you can only do um, continuation to a single um, UTXO. You can't combine two UTXOs together or there's no reliable way to uh, do contracts that have state that where the state is bigger than one UTXO, basically. And whereas in Cardano or Nervos, you can do it because they have a system or either NFTs issued that, that can tag. This is whoever has this NFT is a continuation of this contract. So you can identify the state of the contract by whichever UTXO has this NFT. Uh, this is something that you can't have in Bitcoin unless you add some notion of issued assets or something. And uh, that's a strong limitation in Bitcoin Cash that doesn't have that. But uh, Nervos has a system that is more or less equivalent to, to one of, of Cardano. But is there a discussion of that among Bitcoin core developers that indeed to have contracts that have state, you need to be able to identify the state of the, of the contract or the whatever. And this, this requires you to have some unique tag, usually an NFT in Cardano or they call it a type something. So, in the... so I think the question was generally about um, is there covenants that might add some notion of an asset type to a UTXO? Is that right? Uh, so, yeah, the solution in Cardano mm -hmm. and uh, Nervos, but not in Bitcoin Cash, to uh, the state of a, a, a contract is, that doesn't fit in one UTXO, but that, that fits in multiple UTXOs, is to tag some UTXOs with uh, an FT or something that says this is oh, yeah, yeah. the. Uh, Actually, it's missing in Bitcoin Cash, for instance, and Bitcoin would need to add something more than what Bitcoin Cash added to, to solve this problem. Um, yeah, so Liquid is another uh, example of a chain that has covenants, actually. So Liquid, the sidechain, um, has direct introspection covenants. And even before that, because those are fairly recent, um, even before that, it had Opcat and it had something called Checkstick from Stack that Robin also talked about. And using those two, you can actually fairly simply, but still with a, a certain hack, build a covenant. And there's actually a team that built an automated market maker wow. called Bitmatrix, entirely built on like cat and checksick from stack. And they're doing exactly what you're saying. So like to, to maintain the state in like some execution and the execution goes over two or three transactions, they mint a, a few NFTs and the NFTs are basically a representation of some kind of state that then when you spend it again, you're like, okay, this was about this trade and this trade had these properties and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, if we're going to do really complex things in Bitcoin with simple covenant um, uh, constructions, we're going to have to do stuff like BitVM is doing with multiple transactions where like, but I think that's fair. Opinions? I feel like that, like adding asset type stuff to Bitcoin would be kind of objectionable. Um, but it's also not necessary. Yeah. Like that's the thing is that the, the, the way that the script VM needs to identify state is it just needs to be able to like see you need to be able to have a script that says, okay, I need this output to be spent in this transaction. And I don't need to know anything about what that output represents. And since I'm defining the script through the entire like traversal of this graph, I, you know, whether or not it happens to represent some colored coin protocol or not is you know, an exercise to the reader. It doesn't actually, the consensus does not need to have a notion or an understanding of what that state token is actually representing, asset or otherwise. Yeah, and actually there's another covenant proposal from uh, Salvatore uh, called Matt. And Matt is like a whole construction that does something very similar to BitVM actually, but it's, it's based on a few opcodes and one of them is check contract verify and that's exactly doing this. It's like you encode, you encode a piece of data in a normal Bitcoin output, you don't, you don't need assets. And then the next transaction can actually check or take this kind of like piece of data out of this output uh, they're all 32 bytes uh, data, but like with Merkle trees, if you had cat, you could get like arbitrary amount of data in the in the 32 bytes. So that's exactly what what he was saying that in in Liquid they use the asset types kind of for this, 
But if you have something like check contract verify, like Salvatore is proposing, we could we could carry on state across uh, UTXOs. Yeah, I, I mean, this is just my personal opinion. I don't think it would work in Bitcoin. But the idea of UTXOs being able to carry arbitrary data that's determined when they're constructed in part of the transaction is like actually kind of a good idea. I think maybe that's a hot take, but I, I don't think it would ever be viable in Bitcoin because you would have to change the structure of the state database, which is shared among all of the, the covenant proposals that people are, are discussing today is that none of these things actually change the UTXOs that you store on disk. Uh, they're just about what transactions can enforce about the structure of a transaction. Um, so moving on, uh, we, we just want to wrap up here. We don't want to go too late because it's like 6.30 almost. Um, what do we think the, the horizon looks like? Because Taproot wasn't that contentious, uh, but Covenants, even among the supporters, there's disagreements on, on what they should look like. So is it going to be another five years before they get activated? Or We should also well, talk about like the, the proposals that are out right now. Yeah. Why don't we go over like this concrete proposals that have been discussed recently? There's been a lot of ideas, and people you know, th throw out new ones, it uh, seems like, every week. But there, there's, uh, there's also BIPs and code that has champions. And I think the, the ones right now, there is L Enhance, which is kind of a package of several useful opcodes. Um, Check SIG from Stack, we've already talked about, Op Internal Key, and uh, CTV, which we've covered quite a bit. Uh, and then there's uh, TX Hash, obviously Steven's protocol. Uh, and CAT, I, again, I'll, I'll say this again, CAT isn't a Covenant opcode, but it definitely lets us play with Covenant opcodes, uh, but it's just generally useful for other things. The, the thing that's unique about CAT and why I think it's such a great candidate for a soft fork is that it doesn't step on the toes of these other proposals. So those are the, the three that are kind of top contenders. Am I missing anything? I, I think what the future will hold is that like it's kind of clear that many of the people that championed earlier soft forks are like don't want to be involved in this politics anymore because they're kind of like PTSD and all. And I think like what we need is like get get the whole community warm for like something. And just recently, even though I don't necessarily like the people involved or like the, the things that are, they are <laughs> doing, but this whole thing like get VM came up. And I think I think what we're gonna see in Bitcoin in general is like, if you want something to get through, you need to make everyone warm for this and you're gonna use whatever means are hot at that time. And they're using whatever the means. VM, they're using like images of cats, they're using like <laughs> stories and folklore of Bitcoin history. And if that is the way that we need I mean, is that is if that's is currently the way we need to go about like getting people warm for this? Maybe it is the way, and maybe it's not crazy. I, yeah, it's not crazy. It's because like, it's like politics. And well, it's like any culture or any like community has culture, and culture has like shared myths and stories. So it's like it's as comical as it is to watch some of this stuff play out. It's like I do think that it is like memes, like mimetic repetition ends up being a key part of actually consensus building. Um, I just, I, that's not a skill I have. So I watch, I watch the cat VM guys and I'm just like, this is mad genius and I could not replicate it. <laughs> and and it, it might just be that we need this, we need to do this once, right? We all have this PTSD and maybe cat VM, the whole meme about cat VM will just get us cat and then we can start experimenting with like really ugly cat based covenants and then people will be like, oh, covenants are actually kind of cool and people start thinking about ideas and maybe from then on it will be easier. We, we want to know where the future will be. But. We want to make everyone mad about our really inefficient construction so they'll let us use our more efficient ones. Back. Yeah, <laughs> that's actually a really good point where it's like if you can start to do everything, then you can start to say, okay, these are the most common use cases that people are actually using in the wild. Let's go ahead and implement something that actually optimizes them and makes them cheaper for everyone. And then a lot of people will be like, okay, that's that's actually pretty nice. That, that was very much my hope with CAT. Like I looked at uh, many of the past soft forks and the contention. Um, and uh, one of the reasons that really attracted me to do um, OpCAT, it's just that it's incredibly simple. It was in Bitcoin once. Um, it uh, enables a lot of uh, capability, but it's not like a complex change. Um, you know, it's like 11 lines of code. Um, and that in some sense you can build kind of inefficient things with it. Um, and so it lets us get like our, our feet wet. And if people are building inefficient things with it and there's harm from that, we can say, okay, well, let's not make it efficient. But if people are building inefficient things and it's like, wow, this is like, you know, making Bitcoin better. There's like lots of people that are excited. There are all these new use cases that we can make them like efficient, but it's sort of like lets us, yeah, test out some of these, some of these ideas and play around with them without like, uh, uh, you know, fully committing. 
Um, but also it's like simple enough that maybe uh, the community can get can get behind it um, versus uh, some of the covenant, uh, which is a little bit of a, a harder sell, at least in my opinion. And on the other side, any other covenant proposal, if you want to like actually build cool stuff, most of them also need cat. So like if we already, I mean, cat is just so simple. So if we have cat, like it's not going to hurt anything on the long run because like if you want to do something with CTV or, or, or TX hash and you also have cat, you can do way more things. I think we have one question and then I just want to have a couple bits and then we can close out and it should take like three minutes maybe. Yeah, so just going off the uh, consensus, like acceptance for Bitcoin, it's very hard to get changes passed. Like you said, it's been a few years since the last soft fork, I believe. Um, do we think like there's a better way to like get acceptance? Uh, I was thinking like polling with like the top Bitcoin contributors could have higher weight into it. Um, yeah. But like there's probably got to be a better way to do this. And just wondering like your opinions. There probably is. Yeah, I mean, people I are... Think, I think if there's one thing, I think hard rules don't work, right? We are like, a, we call it rough consensus. I think once you put a hard rule, when you, once you say all the, all the top 100 people on GitHub, then people will just swarm GitHub and try to be in that 100 people. Like, I don't think hard rules are something that, that, that work in politics. So yeah, I mean, it's, we're going to figure out better ways. And I think we're going to like learn and formalize along the way a little bit more and more each time. Um, it's, I think it's most unfortunate that SegWit was so traumatic for like random side reasons, not even because of the content of the proposal, but I think we'll, I think we'll improve. Yeah, once, once a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure is a pretty common occurrence. So it'd be nice if we could rely on that, but then people just start gaming the numbers. I, I like the IETF um, uh, consensus system in which uh, everyone hums. You, you get everyone in a room, and if there's a sufficient, uh, people feel there's a sufficient amount of uh, humming, then it becomes a standard. Um, but there's some difficulty getting everyone in the Bitcoin community into a room and seeing if they hum for various soft forks. Well, I think in general, any any process that tries to outline this is going to stumble into the fact of like who constitutes the community, who gets how much say, right? Like if someone was just came to and bought their first like bit of Bitcoin last week. Does their voice matter as much as like you know, SIPAs, right? And it's like on one hand we don't want to privilege certain people, but at the same time it's very clear that like certain people's voice will carry more weight in a way that's like really really hard to pin down. And so like my, I I gave you kind of a facetious response saying that there probably is a better way. I think ultimately we're trying to drive towards it, but I don't. I think Stephen said that like. Any attempt to like really pin it down is going to be either gamed or it's going to be preemptively vetoed because it can be gamed. Um, and I just also want to add that like people are experimenting with these ideas on on Inquisition, which is I don't remember the specific. Right. I, I was actually going to mention Inquisition. Oh, cool. So so th like it's, it, there is starting to be something that resembles a process. So for example, Bitcoin Inquisition is this kind of low barrier way to activate your software. Granted, like pull requests are still open for a couple months. But it, that is, for example, something that recently uh, Bitcoin Core is trying to experiment with. Let's, let's, let's test out this code. Let's activate it here. Um, we can roll back if there is a problem. But here's like a playground. And, and for those that don't know, Bitcoin Inquisition is a Signet testnet where you know, anything goes. Test Bitcoin. So do we have anything else or we can wrap up? Closing remarks? Let's, let's get confidence. I mean, I'm, I'm all in favor of chat. Send it. <laughs>